So Nicholas, shout out to Nicholas out there because he's got <laughs> us going right now, thinking about all the great things going on with the Thunder and how we've gone from uh, being a team that really, I don't, I don't, we mourned the early ages of the Thunder. It hurt. We needed growth as a city through, you know, watching our team not quite make it to the promised land. Um, and when we watched Russ and KD go head to head in the pl this playoffs, Clippers versus the Suns, like there would have been a temptation in the past to think what could have been. Sure. But it, that never, I didn't give a fuck. Like I did not give a fuck. All I thought about was the new group of Thunder players. And I think that's a remarkable feat for what these guys have accomplished. So Dave, how has this young Thunder core, the youngest team in the NBA, turned into a team that has won the hearts of Oklahoma City? Well, I mean, like, let, let's just put this in context, guys. All right. So 2013 was the last times last time the Knicks had a playoff series win. Okay. 2013. So every single time that from 2013 to this point, they always get compared to that team. Well, first they got to be better than that 2013 team. Then they can start talking. Right. 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 So it's, it's, it's to me, it shows you successful rebuild. If, if our fan base and everybody else around is sitting there right. being like, Hey, we're good. You know, we right. know what we got. We've got these outstanding athletes here as rookies, as second year, as, you know, whatever we have in 30 years, it's perfect what we need. We just need to be patient, take our time. And I, and I think that's the understanding of, of why we believe this team is going to do so well this next year. And let's, let's face it. Like, um, there's a reason why we think Kenny and Aaron Wiggins are really a big part of the, the core of this. It's because like there was, you can't complain about the top end talent we had in the past. Like there's no complaint. We had some of the best players in the league, a guy like Jeff Green, who's still playing in the league, right? Like Serge Ibaka, who just recently, I think he is no longer playing. Like these guys had tremendous NBA careers and we got to see them play young, not to mention, you know, Harden, Westbrook and um, KD, who are still playing at a high level. And I think the thing to look at, though, is there was a lack of depth in the role player category. And it sure. was... It was something that when you looked at a team like the Memphis Grizzlies, you got a little bit jealous of their ability to create role players who were stars in their role. And we had stars, but we didn't have a lot of role players who were stars in their role. Sure. And this team Absolutely. has learned those lessons. So now we have the top end talent, which took a little bit longer to develop um, than guys like Kenny and these guys who were like, I'm going to be the blue collar worker to lead this generation into the next round of greatness. And it's been a really incredible combination to watch, but that's why we always kind of resented this idea that um, people discount the 20 wins that we won before or 20 plus wins we won on the bad years because those were hard fought wins, mm -hmm. right? And those were the foundation of what we're seeing this year. What we saw this year with a 40 plus win season. Yeah. And what we're hoping next year will be a step toward a 50 plus win season. Sure. But that doesn't start, you know, when you suddenly get a pick, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why we no. think Chet will just be an enhancer instead of the guy who comes in and turns the franchise around. Yeah, and, and you know, I got so sidetracked from your, your original question, and I'm sorry about that. But um, I, 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 talk. I, you know, like the, the, the heart, like you asked, how has this team captured the heart? Because it's not like Australian um, uh, folks don't have um, – other Australian players to, to cheer for in the league. You know, they have a ton of them and they've got a ton of hustlers. They've got guys that can score guys that can lead all over the league. And it's amazing how Josh has been able to capture that Australian heart, you know, and as, as he spends more time and in Oklahoma city gets more publicity and Josh always spe steps up in big games. He always comes out and whether it's Madison square garden his first playoff game, it doesn't matter. Josh always has this next gear that he knows how to step up in big games and recognize their big games. Um, I think it's powerful when you have a player like Josh. And I think understanding that Josh has brought this whole passion from Australia with him and the hearts of Australians. And now these Australian you know, uh, folks are starting to watch the Oklahoma City Thunder and get passionate about it. And then 
that's causing passion with you know our home base here in, in Oklahoma City in the United States. It's all of a sudden like, yeah, you guys, I mean, this is the way you build a good organization. And, and they are right. Because if you look at the sports that they have, you know, looking whether it's AFL and footy and or, you know, the NBL, they know how to um, build programs there. You know, whether it's short cash, whatever the, the situations are, they know how to um, build programs. So it's important for us there. And I, I, I look at that and I say that's a big part of creating that passion because, you know, you look at Kenny Hustle, you look at Jay Will, you look at all these guys that just go balls to the wall and you're like, these are the guys that we need to continue to have on this team. We need to continue drafting drafting these guys. And then you're seeing their effects on, on Josh Giddy and Isaiah Joe and all these other guys. And everybody's like, whoa, we didn't know they could do that. And it's all because the belief, the heart, these guys, they feed off of the belief of the fans. And we all believe in them. I mean, you guys are super fans with us. And we're all sitting here and we're saying, these guys can do something great. It's not like you guys are saying no. You guys are saying, well, it may take a year or two more. But you guys aren't disagreeing with us. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's what's powerful about it. Like, I say the Oklahoma City Thunder will be in the Western Conference Finals in, in the next two years. And people are like, well, I don't disagree. I mean, I hope that happens. But I think it's going to be longer, like, three or four years. Right. You know, like, like to me, it's like, what's the difference? You know, like, they're going to be competing for that championship caliber team in two years. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what's so powerful about this team and is what they're doing. And now, again, it's about the belief. People are believing it. People are seeing it. And that's how the fans are, are, are being won over is because, I mean, there's nothing more powerful than belief. You know, we hear a lot of people say it, and they really mean it. But uh, this team plays together. They play for each other. And they play the right way. And all those things mean... Um, kind of like different things to people depending on their like their understanding of the game um and when you have a team though that that makes the extra play and does play for each other right it makes a difference with the team that you see out on the court and oh, i yeah. think that's really oh, yeah. what separates this team versus like a team like the process sixers right where in the end the process when, trust when we, when we went back <laughs> when we went to the time where we were rebuilding there was this deep focus on playing for each other. That's why Coach Degnault was such a great leader in this spot because, you know, he didn't really care about what these losses were doing to his career winning percentage. A lot of coaches do. And I think like he was able to dig in and say like in the darkest moments, we're still going to play for each other. That's why we saw this team lose by an NBA record number of points to the Grizzlies. And we came back and we didn't point fingers. We didn't lose our composure. We didn't play down or negative uh, we came back and we can p- continue to play hard and that's why we look at it and we say like that's what's so important is playing together playing for each other it's what makes us a beautiful brand of basketball oh man i'm so glad you brought that 73 point loss and the reason is is because um that was the hardest podcast i think we've ever done because mark and i have have said since day one like we do positive podcasts about this team we find positive things about the game we do positive things about the coaching staff i mean that's what we do and after the memphis game i remember being like mark are we really going to do a pod and mark's like yeah and it's got to be positive and i was like okay all right cool um and then after we get done and we posted it then on apple the the review section some dude blasted us like just completely tore us apart it was like how do you stay positive after getting beat 73 points? And, you know, that was a moment in my, like, a moment that I'll always remember is not, you know, not because some douchebag called us out for getting, you know, being dumb and doing a positive podcast after a 73 point. We should have just not done one, honestly. No, but I'm glad we did because I'm glad we did. It was a learning we process. On, we focus on the right things, bro. Yeah. And, and I think that's the basis of what, because I, you said it in the podcast. You said, do you think uh, Coach D is in the locker room screaming at the guys right now? Or do you think he's just like, eh, whatever? And I'm like, honestly, if I was a coach, I'd be like, all right, guys, hit the showers. I'll see you in the bus or the plane or whatever. Like, well, what are you going to tell the guys they don't already feel? They just got their asses handed to them. Like, what are you going to ream them out, make them run up and down? No. These are professional dudes. Like, let them be. Let them wallow in their sadness. And then get to the next game. And that's exactly what he did. Didn't we win the next game? Or 
two games later or something like that, we were able to get through that process. And I think that's a key of what we've been able to watch with Coach D. And again, I'm going back to what Nicholas said out there, man, is like, you know, tell us about how um, the Oklahoma City Thunder won the biggest championship this year. And that's the hearts of the fans. And, you know, it, it goes back to the um, Sam Presti believes, right? He believes in Coach D. Coach D believes in his coaching staff. Coach D also believes in his players, and he lets them know that. And if you have this powerful, powerful belief system with inside your organization and with inside your players, I mean, what are we talking about? Where's the stopping point? I mean, there is no stopping point. There's no putting in a period at something. It's like, what can this team do? Well, how many years do we have? Then I'll tell you what we can do. Well, we got a while, and those additional picks just give us additional time to – push that time line down the road. Um, you know, um, I want to give a shout out to Moani and all things basketball guys. Thanks for joining us. Um, so Vic definitely pumped up that you're joining us. And I just want to say anybody else who's listening, you know, we'd love to let us, um, let us tell us where you guys are from and that'll, you know, and we'd love idea. to interact too, guys. Like yeah. if you got something to say, throw it up say? there and we'll, uh, we'll get to it because, you know, we try to be on here for about 35, 30 ish minutes, 40 minutes, whatever we can do. And uh, I mean, you guys direct the conversation a lot. So, so one thing that's going on right now is like the NBA playoffs are going. We were one win away from being in the middle of all this. And you said after, you know, during that time period, you felt like this was going to be the year that like the number eight seed beat the number one seed, the number two seed lost to the number seven seed, a few things like that. Yeah, but we saw it happen on the, you know, in the East. We've seen mm -hmm. a number of, um, different things going on that I would say are um, 90s playoff basketball style. Sure, sure. Um, that we're talking extremely physical. People are going crazy, bro. Going I love it. Crazy. Well, it's 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 it goes to Oklahoma City Thunder's hand. Let's just be honest. I mean, Oklahoma City Thunder know how to get to the line even when fouls are being called or not being called. I mean, Shea does at least. Um, everybody else will learn that. Um, and here's the key with that is when things get really, really physical and everybody's fouling and everybody's throwing elbows and everybody's doing like that in the playoffs, like, like we've seen in the past, this isn't, this isn't, uh, I would say it's been what, 15 years since we've seen this physical of a playoffs, maybe, maybe 20 years. Mm -hmm. So it's been a long time. And I think the NBA wants to switch more to that. You know, like I, I think that they are scared about these tall, skinny, lanky guys being too dominant in the NBA. So I think when they start pulling back on 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 this stuff and they're saying, like, let these guys, you know, get in there, you know, put some meat on, put some time in, and then they can start dominating and we'll change things up again. But right now, like, like let LeBron, let these guys that are the more physical contacted players, let them let them let them go. You know, like, let's see what happens here. And and I think it's cool. I mean, I love it. I love the, the passion and the uh, fighting. But the fighting happens every year. It's not like, you know, this is not something we see. Well, I would say that there's more of it than normal in the first round. What's up, James? Like, there's a lot of people who, like, push each other, challenge each other. But, like, this is resorting to uh, more ejections, I think, than, than I'm used to in this early. And, like, more nut shots, for sure. Um, sure. We're seeing just quite a bit of really good basketball, really good um, drama, right? That's what it's all about. If you remember it's the old TNT that. commercials, right? Like, we know drama. But that's what it's all about. The playoff basketball, top-level um, drama. And so, it's yeah, it's hard. It's hard because we're not in it, right? And it, But we know we weren't really ready. We weren't ready for the lockdown drag out. We we would have been running on fumes by game five. There's no doubt about that. Sure. We need this off season and we need next season, but I feel like next year by game five, if we do make it to a seven game series, we could be hitting a gas, not running on fumes. I think that that's something that needs to be taught and, and learned mm -hmm. that, that game five mentality. I, I want to say that um, I, I believe in two years that this team has every opportunity to get to the Western Conference Finals. But I also believe in the same sense is that there could be a switch here. And in the, in the aspect of 
you get to that first round of the playoffs. And let's just say, you know, for shits and giggles, like we have to play a very seasoned, you know, team at the, you know, let's just say we're at the five, you know, Mm -hmm. or even the six seed. Like we have to play a very seasoned, experienced team at that point. Mm -hmm. Like to me, that means that we're going to have to either a step up to the table in a big way, or our goal is going to be get the experience to five, six, seven games. And that's the goal. And mm-hmm. if we get past it and we win, hell yeah. But for me, it's this next year is saying, guys, with Chet coming on board, we're figuring out what we can do. I'm, you know, Sam Presley saying, I'm figuring out what pieces you guys need, right? And let's put this together and let's see what happens. And I think that's a, a, a big thing that we're going to watch here. I think it's going to be kind of, I'll be honest, I think it's going to be exciting. I think it's going to be exciting to see how Sam Presti uses his pick this year in the first round. I think it'll be exciting to see what Sam Presti is, is, is planning for this team. And then Coach D throwing these guys together. Like, I, I mean, who knows, dude? I mean, who really knows? The West is so wide open right now. And yes, Memphis good, is good. But yes, you know, Denver is good. But these guys are good, be, uh, like three or four seeds on a typical good Western year. Yeah. Like these are not like one and two <clears throat> seeds. So I don't know, man. That's why that's why you're seeing so wanna, teams get beat. I want to talk about the draft really quickly because you got me thinking about it and I don't want to lose this thought, right? So a lot of people have talked about the potential of Presti moving up with the twelve pick and then packaging a few other picks to move up. Um is there a chance maybe something else happens like we pick wherever we land around 12 after the lottery. But then we also trade, find like another Knicks style trade where team in that range is trying to trade out of that spot. And we end up with two picks in that same range, kind of similar to this year, instead of moving up. Do you think something like that happens? So we do end up with two players on the team? I'll tell you the the team that I'm looking at would be, um, I mean, if Dallas doesn't get the guy that they want, I could look at them as, as taking like a, a second round pick and moving back in the draft and we get 10, they get 12. Um, I could see something like that happen. Um, but I, I also could see, I mean, again, looking at 11, I'm circling 11. Mm-hmm. Um, that's Chicago, right? And I'm saying Chicago is a team that either a, they need to win right now or, or not, you know, and if we can give them an opportunity to win right now, and Sam really likes this draft, I could see us going 11 and 12 again. Um, because I, again, I, I think, if I'm Chicago, I'm saying I need another piece. I don't need this number 11th pick, you know, unless they want to go straight to the strip down and rebuild, you know, which I don't think, I think they're past that at this moment. Would, if Chicago wanted to win now and they were willing to trade out a pick. Yeah. It would take something similar to what we gave the Knicks last year for sure. But no, or like it, it would take more of a, a player now, right? Like you wouldn't, they no, but like... what I'm saying is is the reason it wouldn't is mm-hmm. because um, it would be more like a three-way trade, essentially. A three-for-one. Um, we would get... Oh, a three-way trade, a three-way. So you, you would send, we would send out three picks to them. Okay. Um, or two picks if it's a decent pick, you know, or three shitty-ass picks like what we did. Um, right, three shitty-ass picks. Yeah, sending them three shitty-ass picks and saying, you know, whatever. And then we trade out. We trade that, and then we get that first pick they take those three picks and say, we want to go and get blank, you know, fuck it. We don't care. We'll take two other picks and, and put Damian Lillard in there, you know, like that uh, that's the thing. Like create like a five, a five pick deal. Yeah. And that's, and that's the thing that they would be able to do with that one pick. So I would see something like that. If the thunder wanted to steal 11 and take that away from Chicago and, and thunder have, Cause you know, Chicago wants to get better right away. And unless that pick is like top seven, they probably don't want to keep it. Yeah. And if the Thunder are looking at the Houston pick and saying, eh, we'll take that pick if it's 10 through, you know, five or whatever, right? Um, and then if it's, you know, 15 through whatever, or 10 or 11 through blank, we'll give it to Chicago, you know? And then I, Thunder will do shit like that to, to protect whatever they give Chicago anyways um, and make it less valuable. But, you know, I could see that. I could see also a team... <sighs> I mean, I, I look at I look at Blazers, right, man? Mm-hmm. And I circle the Blazers um, as a possibility of wanting to get a player. 
Um, I think they'll be very, um, you know, they started a G League. This is what confused me about this is that they started their G League, right? So are they going to work on development? Are they going to work on Damian Lillard's process, right? So if they were going to work on Damian Lillard's process, if I'm them, I'm coming to the Oklahoma City Thunder and I'm saying, what are they, like the, the sixth pick or something like that, fourth pick, fifth, whatever. I'm saying, I want blank from you. Most likely it will start with a D, ends with a T. And I want blank from you, you know? And I don't I don't ever want to talk about that. But the reality is, is that they, well, they are going to be looking and they're going to be very physical just, about that stuff. I always get like very, like, I don't know that Portland is willing to trade out a pick. Like they always keep, but that's, pick. that's what I'm saying is I, that's what confused me about starting a G league. Are they going to go straight up for the strip down and develop? Mm -hmm. Are they going to try to win with Damian Lillard? Cause I you bet, can't, I bet it's, it's one way or the other. I don't know. I bet they're going to try to do both, bro. I bet you use your second round to build into your G league, which will be a benefit to them if they have the right organizational structure, which I think could be, uh, Mwani's got a good point there that, uh, soggy bread. We appreciate you, bro. Um, that, that right now, because of the Vucevic trade, Orlando owns the rights to the 12th pick. Um, oh, uh, it is Orlando. The, the pick or whatever. It, you're right. Thank you, Mwani. Four, protect, four protected. So, um, yeah. You're like, right. My bad. They don't have to have that problem. <laughs> of one well, again, to do with that. If, Orlando, if Orlando doesn't get the player they want in the top, like let's just say they get bumped back, mm -hmm. you know, and they end up in like a six, they're not going to look at the, the, the 11th pick as as valuable, you know, but they could look at, at another draft and say, we want to have a couple other picks in this draft. You know, so I, I could very easily see Orlando switching out that too. So, I mean, you're right, Mwani. My bad. I should have known this because I've seen the draft board, like, you know, the, um, um, whatever it is, the, um, 14 teams Dude, that are in this lottery. Think about like, we're always going to be the last to find out like these types of trades information does not leak in any way, shape or form. Right. And I think about it, like with this. J Dub Usman Jang situation, right? Like the trade was made, and we still were like, no, no, no. I think there, like, there's something else missing here because we probably traded our pick back. I've never seen a team like really do what we did, which is trade up and take the pick right after ourselves to protect ourselves and get the guy yeah. we wanted and the other guy we wanted. Like, but mm -hmm. we did it. Yeah. And so it was even after the trade that was over, and we were still trying to figure out what was happening. The pick was made and we're like, wait, did we get both of those guys? There's no way, yeah. did we? Right. So we're not going to know in advance, but I, I think like kind of like seeing some things that happen. And then we always talk about it, like Presti's draft, like it says a lot about where he sees the team. Like it's almost, it's not quite as informative of, as him going out and getting a free agent, but that never yeah. happens. So the draft sure. is like a consistent time where we get to see what he thinks the team's needs are and where the team's going to be in the future. So that's really one of our best insights into sure. where the building is going. So we get excited. Um, we're hoping for, you know, one player, more than one player would be great. But, you know, these last few hey, years listen, we've picked up four each year. I think those are over. I, I, and I think you got to look at this, this team. Like we gave Lindy Waters a hell of a contract, right? And he's a, uh, unrestricted free agent. I think this year, um, whether or not we keep him or not, I would like to keep him, you know, even if we bring him back as a G League player, you know, let him play as a G League uh, or two-way player because I think we get three of them now. So, you know, bring him back as a two-way player, like, and then have that extra spot. I mean, that's that's the key right there, man. Right. Because if we have an extra um, place for another player, mm -hmm. then, I mean, we already know, I mean, at this point, um, Dario is gone. I mean, there might be a sign-in trade, you know, whatever. But, you know, at this point, I don't think Dario is going to stay with us. So there's an open spot. So where's the other open spot? You know, if we were to get a first-round pick or even keep our second-round pick, what happens there? You don't think we're going to keep Dario? There's no way? Because I really wish we could. I mean, I wish we could because it would be good for Chet. It would be good for um, uh, Poku. Um, but Good for J-Dub. I, I saw J-Dub. My, my question is, him. is that is he going to take a Mike Muscala deal to stay? Or is he going to t have to go and take, you know, a nine or $12 million deal for three years each, you know, nine to $12 million each year. So I don't, that's up to him, man. That, that's all that that's on him. You know, like he needs to be what's best for his family. But if Mike Muscala is re ready to come back, then I'm all for that too. Dude. I could see him being like 
Moose stuck around for like years. Um, I feel like Sarge could sign like a very good deal for him. Do you think then, he would take a huge like discount? Oh, I don't think it would be a huge discount. I think he, like he I could think sign, he would have to take four or five million dollars less a year to stay with us. I don't think so because I think really? okay. Here, here's the deal. I think what if he only plays for like half of a year and we're basically like, uh, we'll give you more money than anybody else right now. And as contenders are getting ready to gear up for the playoffs, we're going to put you in a spot like Mike to play for a really good team and making a run, right? If, if hmm. you're ready to go. So I think he could really be in a spot where he gets paid more and then we get an asset back and he plays half of a year for us. And, um, but you're probably right. You, you're usually right, and I get yeah. like, I get nostalgic, I get emotional, and I'm like, uh, I like I just, him. I, one I one of the reasons this... I like him is because he was on coach's, you know, rotation at the end of the sure. season, and sure. I hate seeing players from that rotation get dumped. But I mean, it's but a part I think of it's all about that draft. Is there going to be a six foot eight guy in that draft that can do all the things that Lindy Waters can do? You know, just younger and better. You know, like that's that's what I keep on saying in my mind is that like this team is set up and, and, and we're a small market. So, again, we're set up to develop the younger players. Mm -hmm. Eventually, when those younger players become better than the other players, those players that they're better than we are trading and we just got to because we can get three or four picks for them at that time when they're the top of the dog. Boom. And then the other players go. It's the only way to um, sustain success for this team for longevity. And I think. Knowing that in advance, as we're going through this next seven years, and I think that's what we have is a seven year stretch of what I think the Thunder can dominate in. Which also coincides with the length of the new CBA. And the draft picks that we have. Yeah. Don't forget those because those are gonna be incredibly valuable this next time. So I to me, like that's what that's what I'm circling on. That's what I keep on going back to. We have to protect our nuts. And those nuts are our draft picks. Those nuts are our young players. And as those young players develop, we've got to trade out the older guys as they're getting in that 30-plus-year-old range. Now, there's going to be guys like Shea that aren't going to be done peaking, I don't think, at 30. So you're going to keep on, you know, keep him, right? And and I know people are like, what? You don't think Shea's going to be done peaking at 30? No. And the reason is, is because how we're utilizing him and he's getting, you know, two years in a row he played 50 games, Right. And then this last year, I mean, I think he played 70-something games, 72 or 74 or whatever. The point is, is that if that's what he keeps on taking, by the time he's year 10, the Thunder would have saved him an entire almost two seasons. And if you think about that, that's crazy. So I don't know. That's what I keep going back to, is that we can create the, the young players to stay healthy, can develop them, create them so that they can stay playing at a high level in their mid-30s, you know, and allow them to go to the place that they want to go to when they're done with the Oklahoma City Thunder. Because most t players don't retire with the teams that they start with. It's just right. not. They have family and friends and houses all around the world. Right, right. What's up, Corey? Yeah, oh, dude, Corey? for sure, dude. So it's a process of, like, learning what, like, what's going to happen. But in the end, like, get these years and – one thing that happened from 2016 to basically now was there's a process of like, we had to double down on the team we had and then get those contracts extended, play a couple of years and then be able to trade those players for maximum value. And it, it was, there was a lot of valleys in that time period where we saw Russ, Paul George and the rest of the team get torn down. We <coughs> well, even with KD, of, we would go to the playoffs and somebody would get injured, whether it was Russ or KD, you know, and then we would miss the playoffs or barely make the playoffs. And then, limping in and stuff like that like to be in sync for multiple years in a row isn't easy no but it takes going back to what we were saying at the beginning and why this organization has really captured the hearts of the team or the whole city the state and really thunder fans around the world is because like they play for each other it's we're not one player deep you know we're not mm. you know we if we lost shay right you know of course we're not going to be the same team but in the end, the young guys are learning to play in a way where they can step up and fill that gap if he ever does go down. Because in the past, like nobody could replace Russ, nobody could replace mm -hmm. um, Kevin, nobody could replace James. Like it was just like 
those guys did what they did. Nobody else could do it. Now, this and this goes back to Coach Degnall. Now, because of the ball moving from side to side, because we do understand how to challenge defenses and we are maximizing what our players do at a high level, to me, it's different because like we don't need individual players to be as great for this team to you know go beyond what the other teams have done. I mean, you're you're absolutely right. It's not about the greatness with this team. It's about how this team will will gel together. Um, you know, and, and and to me, like I I think about all these different ideas of what a team could be like and how you have a complete team together, and that's what to me really um, captures me about this team. Is typically you have like an older coach, right, mentoring young players or younger coach helping young players go through. I mean, we've seen a couple of them through the years, but in the regular NBA, it's the other way around. To watch a coach, um, star player, and team all learning together and actually developing together, mm -hmm. it's powerful, man. And it's it's beyond anything I've ever seen in, in pretty much any sport besides uh, Major League Baseball. And uh, it's crazy to me. It, it's, it's something that's so unique that when we talk about the hearts of the people and capturing the fans, the fans sometimes don't even know what they're looking at. They just love it. Like, what is happening? This is amazing. you like, for us that, I think I missed one game in the last, or two games in the last three years. You know, like we don't miss games, you know? And so we see it, right? And it's not until everything is over that you take a step back and look at it. And you're like, holy shit, what's happening here? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. is this for real? Mm -hmm. Then you're like, no, this is. I'm not, this is not a... Like this team is designed for a dynasty run. And the fact that we started saying that, what, like six months ago, and that an entire NBA is like, <laughs> as Beavis and Butthead say, <laughs> did, did, bung hard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is. It's fun to watch the chorus of NBA fans start lighting up as they realize that. Like this team really is poised to take the next round, and these other teams are beating each up on each other in the playoffs. Like you're looking at the last generation of great players, and you know what's going to happen with the next generation of great ones, and that's where the Thunder are going to be leading the way. Um, we got a little taste of it this year, and now we're getting greedy, like really greedy. We mm -hmm. want more. We want a deep playoff run. But look, man, it's going to take another level. It's going to take another level. You look at what coach believed his rotation was down the stretch. It was not very big. Like he was playing 11, 12 players, all 82 games. But as soon as we got into the play in, he cut it down to like what? Eight focus, and bro. It was, it showed to me how few players had actually earned his trust throughout the season. It was an elimination game setting. And like that bench was not, <laughs> deep now maybe it was because of um injury maybe if we had kenny and poku some of these other guys would have earned more minutes but it wasn't deep and that lack of depth to me is a big reason why we weren't capable of, of pushing through but one of the guys that made it into that final rotation was lindy waters now i'm not going to say who but i, I watched some thing today they said Lindy Waters had like a B or B minus or something like that, like on the season. One thing that's everybody's got to understand about Lindy Waters was for him to earn coaches trust and be in the rotations in these situations was so far in a way the best, um, the most improvement any player had on the team. Now he's not going to win the most improved player award because that's, you know, an award that goes to, you know, people who put up 30 or whatever, you know what I mean? But like he took steps that were incredible this season and it's easy to compare him to Shea and be like, well, he didn't have as good a season to one of the you know best players on the team. Fine. Like, but did he exceed where he was supposed to be when he came in and he did it in a huge way. And it wasn't because he came in and shot like Ray Allen. You know, it was it, no. he did shoot the ball well in some games, but we saw sure. him shoot the ball great in G League games. But one, I think, NBA game did he shoot the ball really, really great. But he did it because he competed on, um, you know, going back to Coach's analogy of broccoli plays versus Skittles. Like, sure, he if the ball was loose around him, 
he was making sure that we ended up with the possession. He would jar the ball loose if people weren't securing it near him. Mm-hmm. He created turnovers, which created opportunities, and that's why he earned his way into that final rotation. The question is, can he figure out how to be like an Isaiah Joe lighted up guy? Because if he can, with the way he competes on defense, he'll be a two way player for us for a while. I uh, I mean I agree, and and I I want him to be on this team because I see the benefit of having a player like Lindy Waters, um, mm-hmm. both both in the locker room and out you know on the court. Um, but again, if we're looking at this team and we're saying like, do I think that he needs to be a two way player next year? Or is he ready for a full season in the NBA? And that's where Look, I go I, back and forth. I said the word two-way player. I meant both. More, like I know. I know. Offense defense. and do-way. Yeah, defense. Yeah. yeah. And I was saying a two-way contract. Okay, cool. I should have been clear on that. My bad. Um, but with him with a two-way contract, like I, I don't I, – I, I struggle at, at this because all I see with Lindy Waters is like this incredibly positive player. You know, like I personally would rather him play a full season in the NBA next year. Me too than him going back and forth to G League. And one of the reasons is because he's shown that he can do it. Like, he's deserved it. Like, yeah, he probably just made an extra million and a half dollars, and it could be Sam Presti sitting him down and saying, Lindy, right. I, I, I want you to be on a two-way contract with us next year, but I want you to have the freedom to look at, you know, whatever. I'm going to give you a contract right now that's going to allow you to have extra money to do what you need to do. You know, I hope that's what that was, because the reality is, is that um, if Lindy Waters doesn't start on the, or play on this team, then he's got to go someplace else to look because he deserves to. You know, there's there's teams like Orlando that he could go and probably start on or at least be top seven. <laughs> Maybe Detroit. Not. I mean, there's there's guys teams like that that he could go and and get um, more minutes out. Yeah, and that's and I hate saying it because I love Lindy, but that's we need I keep to keep him about. because it's the best thing for him too. But if you know if he does find a different place that will pay him more, that's fine. But yeah, like he's got to take him, what he's got to take, man. I'd rather see him get another year with coach Dagnall because I think like he could bring out the door in him. And if you ended up with an elite defender, which I don't think a lot of people are thinking he's near, but like, even though he doesn't have like closer than a lot. Yeah, I know. Just because he's so good at creating turnovers. I think he would be what I would consider last year. um, Our fourth best defending guard. Right. Why and would I would you say give that up for defending nothing? guard. I want to throw that out there. Hybrid defending guard because he played a lot of the the small forward position on defense and had forward. was forced to play that position. Right. So he's bigger than you think. Yeah, he's what six 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 seven. Yeah, he's, it might he's, be. He plays like six, six, six seven, and you notice it when he gets up for a rebound. That's when you really notice super it, long he's arms like that length, you know. And I think that's why you have to be willing to develop a player like Lindy and um, why I want to see him play with the Thunder. But on the same sense is that. Uh, Home is home, you know, mm-hmm. like he'll always feel home here in the Oklahoma City Thunder. And if he has to go and try to figure out, like, I was never I was never one of those guys that was mad at LeBron for leaving Cleveland, right? Mm-hmm. Because I, I looked at it as every man comes to a point in his life where the, he's got to step up and either A, move away from home, or B, move out of his parents' house. <laughs> you know, like, when I say move away from home, move out of the state or out of the city. Um, you know, like, these are these are moments in these kids' lives. And sometimes kids need to be able to do that. And Lindy Waters might have to do that in order to spread his wings. And if he has to, guys, I I want the best for him. It's not about what I want. Lindy needs to play big time minutes because he deserves it. And that's what he showed on the court last night or last night, last season. Yeah. Over and over and over again. So we appreciate everybody joining us. Mwani, Vic, James, Corey, soggy bread we appreciate what you're saying man we'll bring we'll bring out more content but as of right now we're we're just just chilling man consistent we got like what two and some change days until or two weeks and some change days until the uh lottery so i think we just chill out man we'll do we'll do a live for the lottery thing even though it might be one of those short ones where in the first three um (laughs) first three we'll probably hear the thunder called (laughs) <laughs> but I'm all right with that. Man. We're um, pumped up. Everybody keeps sticking with us because this off season, there's going to be some, some action right now. We're at the slow spot where we're enjoying other, you know, 
NBA teams. Um, we've mentioned it a bunch of times. We grew up fans of the New York Knicks. No bing bong. <laughs> no love for the Knicks anymore. But I'll tell you what. <laughs> some of the, something I still have a lot of affection for was growing Thanks, up Frank. in the 90s watching, um, <laughs> watching the Knicks and the Heat play in the playoffs and the a level <laughs> of intensity that that series brought when Pat Riley went down to Miami and it was Lonzo Mourning versus Patrick Ewing and, and oh you got Lonzo Mourning versus um, Van Gundy right right and I feel like <laughs> I it's good for basketball that that series is about to happen again Nick's heat I'm excited about watching that shit. second round at that too I mean yeah. think about the second round Nick's heat I mean go back to the 90s you go back to the early 2000s it's dude it's just rich in history. If you guys haven't had an opportunity and you're new watch to the it. NBA or the Knicks or whatever, just go watch some highlights from the 1990s of how insane it would get. It would Fun. be like Lonzo Mourning throwing Charlie Ward into the stands. Like it, like things got crazy, and it was all because just passion was boiling over. And you know what? You know these guys saw those games growing up. Yo, the amount. Uh, intensity. I'll tell you right now, there's a reason why New York, why, why MSG is known as the greatest place to play basketball. The Mecca. But listen, you know what? It's not because of anything that's been done in the last 20 years. It was everything before. So this, even if they don't win, no matter what, New York City is about to show out. And there's a lot of pent up frustration. So mm. speaking of pent up frustration, as sure. the great Tosh point oh says, what, what in the butt? <laughs> All right, guys, <laughs> we'll see you Monday. We hope you <laughs> enjoy your weekend. Smoke a fat one for us. Peace. No out. doubt.